This video will cover how to perform a lumbar puncture in pediatrics, including how it is different from one in adults due to differences in anatomy, the contraindications and complications of the procedure, common problems and solutions, as well as a step-by-step -step explanation of the procedure. A lumbar puncture is frequently required for children who are suspected of having a central nervous system infection, such as meningitis or encephalitis, an autoimmune condition, or a genetic condition. The procedure allows for a sample of cerebrospinal fluid to be tested for cell counts, protein, glucose, lactate, culture or PCR testing, or other specialized immune and genetic markers. A lumbar puncture is also used to measure opening pressure for children. Measuring opening pressure may be necessary for conditions such as idiopathic intracranial hypertension, but this is beyond the scope of this video. What makes performing a lumbar puncture in pediatrics different from one in adults? One, sedation and analgesia is likely required for cooperation. Two, children's anatomy is different. The spinal cord ends higher in adults than in neonates. This means you can enter your needle below L3-4 in adults, but at L4-5 in neonates. Three, equipment differences. The 22 or 25 gauge beveled spinal needle with stylet that you will need for the lumbar puncture will vary in length depending on the patient's age. In neonates, the length of the needle should be 1.5 inches. In children, it should be 2.5 inches. And in adults, the length of the needle should be 3.5 inches. Now, let's review the contraindications and complications of a lumbar puncture. When considering a lumbar puncture, primary contraindications are the patient is clinically unstable with respiratory or cardiovascular compromise, a skin infection at the lumbar puncture site, coagulopathy or severe thrombocytopenia, a suspicion of raised intracranial pressure either clinically or on head imaging. Clinical signs of intracranial pressure include focal neurological deficit, Cushing's triad, focal or refractory seizures, papilledema, and or a persistently reduced level of consciousness. The three features of Cushing's triad are bradycardia, elevated systolic blood pressure and widened pulse pressure, and irregular respirations. Remember, normal head imaging does not rule out increased intracranial pressure when there are clinical signs. Do not delay antibiotics or antivirals. If there is a contraindication to performing a lumbar puncture, start antibiotics immediately and perform a lumbar puncture when it is safe and the contraindications are no longer present. If a patient is suspected of having a CNS infection and there is a contraindication to performing a lumbar puncture, start antibiotics and or antivirals immediately. Know the complications of a lumbar puncture. With sterile technique, lumbar punctures are safe and well-tolerated. Complications, though rare, can include headache, introducing infection, bleeding, backache. And extremely rare complications are subarachnoid epidermal cyst, temporary dysesthesia, brain herniation. Next, let's review the relevant anatomy. Neonates have approximately 50 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid that bathes the brain and spinal cord. This increases throughout childhood until the adult volume of 150 milliliters is reached. For reference, one milliliter of cerebrospinal fluid is equivalent to about 20 drops. Neonates produce the fluid at a rate of 25 milliliters per day whereas adults produce 14 to 26 milliliters per hour. In neonates, the spinal cord ends at L3. By adulthood, the lowest level of the spinal cord ends around level L1, L2. Below the spinal cord is a large cerebrospinal fluid-filled space that contains nerve roots. 
To avoid the spinal cord, enter at a level below it. This is typically at L4-5 in a neonate and L3-L4 or L4-L5 in an adult. Remember, when you perform a lumbar puncture, the spinal needle will travel through the skin and subcutaneous tissue, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, between the spinous processes, through the ligamentum flavum, through dura mater, into the subarachnoid space. Next, let's plan a discussion with caregivers regarding a lumbar puncture. Caregivers and patients, depending on the child's developmental stage, need to understand what information will be gained from the lumbar puncture and how that information will help in making decisions or a diagnosis for their child. Provide a simple explanation and let them know that the positioning for the procedure may make their child uncomfortable. Create a plan with the caregivers on how to mitigate any pain or anxiety. Caregivers need to know there is a chance that the procedure could be unsuccessful and what the contingency plans are. Families' most frequent concerns about lumbar punctures are pain, infection, and permanent neurologic damage. If caregivers don't agree to have the lumbar puncture performed, explain possible alternatives, such as prolonged treatment with intravenous antibiotics. Direct caregivers to trek.ca under the Parents and Families Resources tab for more information on meningitis. Now, let's review the steps for a lumbar puncture. Step one, analgesia. Success rates for pediatric lumbar punctures are higher when analgesia is used. If time allows, apply topical analgesic cream. Maxiline works in 30 minutes and Emla works in 45 to 60 minutes. Apply the cream as soon as you consider performing a lumbar puncture to avoid delays and allow time for the topical to be effective. Oral sucrose can be given to neonates under one year of age at the time of procedure in addition to topical analgesia. Step 2. Sedation. Decide on a sedation and monitoring plan, if required, using the procedural sedation resources from trek.ca. Step 3. Materials. Gather sterile gloves, a skin cleaning solution, procedural mask, and a commercially available lumbar puncture tray, which should include procedure tray, sterile drapes, four CSF tubes, 22 or 25 gauge beveled spinal needle with stylet, 1.5 inches in length for a neonate, 2.5 inch length for a child, 3.5 inches length for an adult. For skin preparation solutions, neonates have sensitive skin and need povidone iodine, like betadine, or 1% chlorhexidine and 70% isopropyl alcohol. The preferred solution in any other age group is 1% chlorhexidine plus 70% isopropyl alcohol. Step four, positioning. Ensure that there is someone to position and monitor the patient. Position the patient in a sitting or lateral lying position to allow for a wider opening of the spaces between the spinous processes. For lateral lying, one hip should be directly above the other, fully flexed, with the plane of the hips at 90 degrees to the floor. Your assistant should hold the child behind the shoulders and knees to attain spine flexion. The neck can stay in a neutral position, not flexed. Remember, when performing the lumbar puncture in a lateral lying position on a neonate, it's crucial to lie the neonate safely near the edge of the bed. Otherwise, you will have trouble collecting the cerebrospinal fluid with the tubes in the lumbar puncture kit. An alternative position is sitting with the patient's neck and back fully flexed. Double check that the child's position is maintained prior to inserting the needle. Step five, landmarking. Palpate and mark anatomy before the sterile field is set up. Tuffier's line, which joins the most superior aspect of both iliac crests, crosses the midline over the L4 spinous process. Choose the space inferior to this for the lumbar puncture. It is critical that the space be well below the termination of the spinal cord. Step six, sterile field. Prepare a sterile field by cleaning hands, 
donning a mask and sterile gloves. Disinfect the site and then apply sterile drapes. Re-landmark and use local analgesia if topical analgesia was not applied. Step 7. Procedure Insert the needle with the stylet in place, below the spinous process in the midline. Angle the needle at 15 degrees toward the umbilicus. Advance the needle parallel to the floor. The bevel of the needle should be parallel to the spine, in the sagittal plane. In other words, the bevel should be pointed to the ceiling if the patient is in the lateral decubitus position, and pointed either left or right if the patient is sitting. You may feel a pop as it passes through the ligamentum flavum. Withdraw the stylet to check for cerebrospinal fluid flow. If there is cerebrospinal fluid flow, collect five to 10 drops in each tube, unless you're ordering a specialized test that requires more. Now that we've reviewed the lumbar puncture procedure in pediatrics, let's address common problems and what to do when they occur. In the case of slow cerebrospinal fluid flow, turn the needle 90 degrees. A nerve root or blood clot may be causing blockage. You can also replace the stylet, withdraw the needle slightly and reposition, then remove the stylet and check for cerebrospinal fluid flow. In the case of a dry tap, replace the stylet and withdraw the needle slightly, re-angle or reposition, then remove the stylet, advance, and recheck for cerebrospinal fluid. The needle may not be in the correct horizontal plane or may be in the sacral spine below the subarachnoid space, where no cerebrospinal fluid exists. A bloody tap may indicate the puncture of a nerve root vessel or, more rarely, an epidural vessel if advanced too far. In the case of a bloody tap, reinsert the stylet and withdraw the needle slightly before removing the stylet again to see if cerebrospinal fluid flows. Collect a sample for culture and sensitivity if it does not clear, and the indication was for a possible central nervous system infection. Another attempt may be required at a level below. Consider the rare possibility of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Once your sample is obtained, replace the stylet and remove the needle and stylet together to reduce the chance of a post-lumbar puncture headache. Put a small band-aid over the top of the site. Dispose of the sharps appropriately. There is evidence to suggest that remaining on the back does not reduce the chance of a headache. Now that you've safely and successfully performed a pediatric lumbar puncture, all that's left to do is document the procedure and debrief with the caregivers. Thank you for watching.